sometimes my mom mails me random books. Normally I don't read them since my reading queue is already as large as the gaming queue on my Steam library. But one day she sent me this book, Bruno Schultz Collected Stories. I'd heard of Schultz. I associated him with Poland, Jewishness, and a minor classic entitled The Street of Crocodiles. But I didn't intend to read this book anytime soon. Then my mom called and implored me to read it, telling me how there'd been an article about the author in the news and his writing would be completely strange. I didn't doubt her, and I felt kinda bad since she wanted me to read the book so much. And yet, with the blasé and meaningless callousness of the everyday, I decided I wouldn't broach the book's pages. Then I saw the foreword was written by Rivka Galchen! Didn't expect to cross paths with her again. Dang, I thought. Now I not only have to read the book, but I'll have to make a book collection video, too. I was right about Bruno Schultz, and will probably mispronounce his name every time I say it. He was a Jewish-Polish language author who wrote two books, one of which is The Street of Crocodiles. Or rather, it's actually entitled Skle Sklepi Cinnamonowe? I don't know Polish. In English, cinnamon shops. As Madeleine Levine, the translator, reveals in the introduction, The Street of Crocodiles was the title the publisher arbitrarily gave to Zelina Wieniewska's English translation in 1963. This might seem inexplicable, but the English publication of one of Kinzaburo Oe's novels calls it The Silent Cry, when the original title is Football in the First Year of Manon. So this kind of title tomfoolery happens sometimes, I disapprove. Anyway, Levine's translation is part of a broader project. Something called the Polish Book Institute is commissioning new English-language translations of Polish literature, part of the Poland translation program. There have been some similar projects for Korean literature and Kazakhstani literature. That could be a later video. By the way, if you're some kind of huge Bruno Schultz fan and you've clicked on this video because you thought, hey, I'm a big Bruno Schultz fan. I'm afraid you're probably not going to get much out of this. Um, I'm no kind of expert, and I don't have any bold claims to make about his stories or anything. My main goal in this video, I suppose, is just to make people aware of Schultz who weren't aware of him before. If only, given my audience, a rather small number of people. Rivka Galchen's introductory essay simply talks about Schultz's stories, the way time in them is alive, certain of their bizarre details, how the world of the story seems dominated by the father. Apparently, Schultz is often compared to Franz Kafka, but I agree with Galchen that the comparison is largely erroneous, although she describes the situation in much nicer language than I might. Arguably, Kafka and Schultz wrote in the same genre, though. G.S. Evans calls this genre irreal. Whereas Kafka cultivated stories of paralyzing anxiety, Schultz's stories, though dark and weird, one even features a man turning into a cockroach, are, at heart, fun. And funny. Supposedly, Kafka found his stories riotously funny, but fun is not the word for him. Another big difference from Kafka is that Schultz occasionally ends sentences, and reading them doesn't instantly cure insomnia. One of the stories told of Schultz is that when he was a young boy, his mother saw him feeding grains of sugar to the house flies, and when she asked him what he was doing, he said he was helping the flies make it through the winter. I like him already. Collected Stories of Bruno Schultz, as the title indicates, contains all of Schultz's stories. He published two books, Cinnamon Shops and The Sanatorium Under the Hourglass, as well as four standalone short stories. It had been a long time since I'd read writing of this style, writing that exists primarily not to convey information or a plot, but to be art in of itself. In the same way a painter with brush strokes creates an image, Schultz with words creates gripping dreamscapes and fantasies. Or Levine does. I'm trusting her translation given, as she says, that she means to, quote, convey the linguistic tics and mannerisms of Schultz's style apparently in contrast to Celina Wieniewska's translation. Though a novel of prose, and prose once removed from Schultz's Polish at that, these pages are replete with poetry. The effect is incredible. I don't know how to describe it without simply reading some of it to you. 
Suddenly, he stands as if rooted to the spot. In front of him, some three puppy steps away, a freak is moving about, a monster sliding along rapidly on little sticks that are its many jumbled legs. Shaken to his core, Nimrod follows with his gaze the oblique path of the glossy insect, tensely following the flat, headless, blind thorax carried along by the unbelievable mobility of its spidery legs. Something rises inside him, something ripens, swells, something he himself does not yet understand, a kind of anger or terror, but rather pleasant and linked to a shudder of power, self-awareness, aggression. And suddenly he collapses onto his front paws and projects a voice as yet unknown to him, alien, totally unlike his ordinary whimpering. He projects it once, and once again, and yet again, in a thin, high-pitched voice that keeps going off course. But in vain does he apostrophize the insect in this new language born of sudden inspiration. In the categories of the cockroach mind, there is no room for this tirade, and the insect continues on its oblique circuit toward the corner of the room, amid movements consecrated by an eternal cockroach ritual. Schultz got all that from describing a puppy seeing a cockroach. So much juiced from so little. Bruno Schultz Collected Stories is 269 pages of that, more or less. This is the literary equivalent of Baroque architecture, sans the context of Reformation politics. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if a style like this were put to use in an elaborate thriller or something, but then that might defeat the purpose. My impression had been that Schultz wrote short stories. That also seems to be the general claim of the literary community. But Cinnamon Shops is a novel! complete with recurring, consistent characters and stories referring back to the earlier stories. In effect, these aren't short stories, but chapters. Most of the chapters can stand on their own, true, but this interconnectedness significantly transformed my understanding of the work as a whole. The point of Cinnamon Shops is the emotions elicited in the prose prosody, not what literally happens. Summarizing the plot of Cinnamon Shops would be useless. Which is exactly why I'll dawdle away our scant time on this earth to summarize it anyway. The identities of the characters aren't explained up front, but rather emerge over the course of the novel. The narrator is a boy who lives in an apartment building with his mother and father. His father is a cloth merchant. The narrator seems to have at least one sister and one brother. The apartment's in an urban area, but the city never specified is likely intended as Schultz's own hometown, Drahabich, now in present-day Ukraine or at least it's meant as a strikingly similar town. The narrator's father, as is implied earlier but only revealed definitively more than a hundred pages in, is named Yakub. Incidentally, only a few pages earlier do we learn the narrator's name, Yosef, Yosef Shymek. Another important figure is Adela the Maid, to whom we vaguely ascribed a kind of mission and commissioning from powers of a higher order. Supposedly, she puts on makeup more than she cleans, the apartment building teems with cockroaches, and on the lower story stay an undefined number of sales clerks. The building itself seems to be a living organism. Uh, from page 10, Our apartment had no fixed number of rooms since no one ever remembered how many of them were rented out to unknown tenants. Occasionally, one of these forgotten rooms would be opened by accident and discovered to be empty. The tenant had long since moved out, and unexpected discoveries were made in drawers that had not been touched for months. After the summer holiday described in the story August, autumn sets in. The second chapter is entitled A Visitation. An illness afflicts Yakub, but he continues his work, having account books brought to him from the office. Yakub comes down with some kind of psychosis, muttering to himself and hiding like an insect in various corners of the building, sometimes vanishing for whole days. What remained of him was a small amount of corporeal casing and that handful of senseless eccentricities. They could disappear one day, as unnoticed as the gray pile of trash collecting in a corner that Adela carried out every day to the garbage bin. This is a pattern in Schultz's writing, people transforming into things like intestines, or into eccentricities and flesh casings, in this case. The father hasn't died, though. He is by far the most developed character, his increasingly bizarre antics a revolt against the encroaching gray of Drahabich. As his son puts it, only today do I understand the lonely heroism with which he, all by himself, waged war on the boundless element of boredom stupefying our city. His illness continues in the next chapter, Birds. 
Adela gains a strange power over Yakub, so that when she merely points at him, immediately he would flee through all the rooms, slamming the doors behind him, finally to collapse belly down on a bed in the last room and writhe in convulsions of laughter under the influence of the internal image that he could not resist. He thinks he's being tickled. You see what I mean when I say Cinnamon Shops is funny? Abruptly interested in animals, Yakub, with great expenditure of labor and money, imports dozens of bird eggs from a huge variety of exotic species, or bird's eggs, as the text calls them. Yakub incubates the eggs until he has a huge swarm of birds living in the building. Somehow or other, probably with Adela's help, he and the birds are driven into the garret rooms that served as junk rooms. Of a special importance is a condor, whom Yusuf views as human and very much like his father. He adds that it shared the chamber pot with his dad, too. Ew. In the attic, Yakub becomes the king of the birds, presiding over bird weddings and that kind of thing. Rarely emerging, still shrinking away, he attempts to become a bird himself. But eventually, Adela bursts into the garret rooms, which are filthy with bird shit and packed absolutely full of fowls. Wielding her broom, she drives every last one of them out. This is one of the few genuinely sad moments in the novel, for me. Yakub was doing something beautiful in some bizarre way, though something had to change or he would have starved to death. A moment later, my father descended the steps from his dominion. A broken man, a banished king who had lost his throne and his kingdom. The next four chapters are unique among the rest in that they are the only that don't stand on their own. Each is a direct, immediate continuation of the previous. The titles send the message too. Mannequins, a treatise on mannequins, or the second book of Genesis, a treatise on mannequins continued, and a treatise on mannequins conclusion. I really am surprised Schultz is known as a short story author. The chapters are episodic, but absolutely form a cohesive whole, not only thematically, but in terms of literal continuity. Guess this is the difference between regarding a television series by its individual episodes rather than by its whole. In the Mannequin Quadrilogy, we see the incredible, tangled, deeply sinful and unnatural turn in Yakub's interest in animals that Yusuf warned us about in Birds. Though I didn't mention that warning until now, it's there. Yakub, fleeing Adela's territory, disappears. Forgotten again, he only returns when Adela happens to be away, and chats with, or rather lectures, Polda and Paulina, a couple young seamstresses busy adorning a mannequin. Ah, how little did they demand from reality. They had everything in themselves. They had an excess of everything in themselves. Ah, a piero stuffed with sawdust would have sufficed for them, the word or two for which they had long been waiting that they might fall into their long-prepared role, which had long since been pressing onto their lips, full of sweet and terrible bitterness, racing wildly like the pages of a romance devoured at night along with the tears shed onto their blushing cheeks. Just amazing writing. I think it actually feels better read aloud. In the introduction, Galchen mentions that David Grossman, author of To the End of the Land, claimed to have met an old man who claimed to have been one of Schultz's art students from 1939 to 1941. So she knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy. Or she read a guy who... Re you get the picture. The old man told Grossman that Scholz mainly taught children with disciplinary problems, and that he began telling them wild stories as a survival tool. Even the wildest animals listened. Then, anecdotally at least, Scholz may have originally spoken his dreamscape stories aloud. No wonder Levine's translation feels better spoken. I suppose, like Galchen received the story from the old man, I'm only receiving these stories after a kind of translation telephone game. This is prose poetry, anyway. Poems are traditionally intended for oral recitation. In any event, Polda and Paulina seem nice, what with the enamel of their eyes and all. Jakub takes an interest in examining their bodies, less in a sexual way and more out of mechanical interest. Polda and Paulina gladly put themselves on display, twisting at the hips, glistening with the enamel of their eyes, the lacquer of their creaking slippers, the buckles of the garters under their skirts that the wind was billowing out. Um, are Polda and Paulina mannequins too? A general fascination with bodies, particularly women's, recurs throughout Schultz's writing. 
Paulina becomes Jakub's student, as over the course of several days, he preaches how God, or as he calls him, the Demiurge, does not monopolize the ability to create life. Apparently, matter inherently wants to be alive, or rather, it is. There is no dead matter. Lifelessness is only an external appearance behind which unknown forms of life are hiding. The scale of these forms is infinite, their shades and nuances inexhaustible. The mannequin itself, Jakub insists, possesses a form of life, desperate to exist in some vaguely human sense. Here, the mannequin takes on qualities of both the living and the inanimate. Not only insane raving from the rather absurd father figure, these are poetical observations about something. It's like what that something is exists in the periphery of my vision, and I can never quite turn to bring it into focus. So, like Kafka, the closest cinnamon shops comes to horror is when Jakub raves about wax mannequins. He constructs a nightmare of mannequins tormented to be mere imitations of humans, gawked at like sideshow freaks, how at night they howl and scream, beating at the walls of the waxworks. In the final chapter of the story arc, Jakub began constructing before our eyes an image of his dreamed of generatio equivoca, a generation of beings only half organic. They were creatures similar in appearance to living beings, to vertebrates, crustaceans, arthropods, but this appearance was deceptive. The creatures are actually made from some kind of chemical solution mixed with table salt. The reason they resemble animals is because there are only so many forms that matter can take on when brought to life. Is this some kind of reference to Plato's world of forms? Also, should the reader take this as actually happening, or is Jakub simply describing the generatio equivoca to Josef, Polda, and Paulina? In the narration, where does metaphor or imagination end and literal description begin? Jakub gives us this incredible description of the matter left to ferment in abandoned apartments. Early one morning toward the end of winter, after many months of absence, I entered such a half-forgotten tract and was astounded by the look of those rooms. From every crack in the floor, from every molding and frame, thin sprouts shot out and filled the gray air with a glimmering filigree of lacy foliage, with a conservatory's openwork thicket full of whispers, shimmers, swinging, a kind of spurious and blissful spring. Around the bed, beneath a many-armed lamp, along the wardrobes, clusters of delicate trees were swaying, spraying upward into luminous crowns, into fountains mountains of lacy foliage, striking with their atomized chlorophyll right up against the painted sky of the ceiling. In an accelerated process of blooming, enormous white and pink flowers were sprouting in that foliage, blossoming before one's eyes, shooting out lushly from the center as pink pulp, then overflowing their edges, dropping their petals, and disintegrating in rapid conclusion to the flowering cycle. I was happy at this unexpected blossoming that filled the air with a twinkling rustle, a gentle sound pouring down like colored confetti through the branches' slender twigs. Okay, this nearby passage about the wood forced to coexist in the form of a cabinet's also excellent. Good to know I'm not the only person to have such animistic thoughts. Eventually, too upset with Jakub's lectures about the unliving sprouting to life and the living breaking down, Polda begs Adela to drive him away. She wags her finger, and powerless before her, Jakub flees. The next story is entitled Nimrod and features Yusuf's memory of the puppy he got in the August of that year. This chapter ends with that incredible scene I read from earlier, uh, the puppy seeing his first cockroach. Wait, the August of that year? The first chapter is titled August. Does this mean the stories so far have all taken place in August? This is when I first became aware of the framing of these stories. Yosef must be reminiscing about the year his father went mad. I'm not sure how old Yosef was at the time of the stories, but I assume quite little, maybe six or seven. Why the title Nimrod? That's the puppy's name. Since Nimrod's a mytho-historical hunter, it must be an ironic reflection on his inability to pounce on the cockroach. The next chapter, Pan, made me wonder if Schultz would have a succession of chapters bearing the names of mythological figures. But no, these are the only two. 
Generally, despite the many cockroaches and sales clerks, Yosef seems to be alone. In this story, though, he wanders into a weed-filled lot with some other little boys. I love this. The despair of the stinking dead end had been hitting its head against this barrier for so long that it finally loosened one of the strong horizontal boards. Do you hear what's happening here? An emotion of the dead end, the emotion of a concept, becomes a physical object with a head to hit a fence post off its nails. Again, in Schultz's stories, things are always becoming other things, metaphorically and literally. In this story, incredibly, leafy vegetation becomes stripping witches. Nothing much is actually happening, it's just a description of a bunch of plants, but what an imagination. Pan, by the way, is a homeless man Yosef encounters in the field of burdocks. Up to his armpits in them, apparently. The names Pan and Nimrod both suggest a mythology. This is another pattern. In the Mannequin Quadrilogy, Yakub evokes ideas of a demiurge and Genesis and the creation of new life, and his ongoing conflicts with Adela have a supernal timber. The next chapter, Uncle Carol, is apparently the one that most stuck with Rivka Galchen after she read Vinivska's translation. This is another story that is all description and no event. Yusuf talks about his fat Uncle Carol going to bed and waking up. In such minute, fleshy detail, he describes one of his eyes' slight motions. Yes, only one of them, apparently after the man has a vision of his bleak future. What Galchen remembered is the ending of the chapter, a paragraph-length sentence that describes Uncle Carol leaving his bedroom, and closes with his reflection in the mirror moving through an empty enfilade of rooms that did not exist. What remarkable imagery of the haunting unreality of mirrors we so take for granted. Or the haunting ear reality. The overall impression ain't one of hope for this guy. An organism swelling with fat, worn out from sexual excesses, but still flooded with abundant juices. God, the writing is always so fleshy. Everything and everyone is sprouting with living things. Finally, the next chapter is Cinnamon Shops. Might be the title story, but after August, this was definitely my least favorite. On a winter night, Yusuf and his family go to the theater. This is part of the mother's ongoing campaign to distract Yakub from his strange investigations, which, although understandable, seems to frame her as a kind of villain. Yakub, though he's silly, is a rebel against the encroaching boredom of life in the city, whereas the mother receives basically no characterization besides being lazy. I suppose it's better than forgetting about the shrinking father like she and Yusuf keep doing, and Yusuf's siblings, I assume. What are the cinnamon shops? Basically, they're some shops to sell useless random junk. But this random junk absolutely moves Yosef's imagination. You could find Bengal lights there, magic boxes, stamps of long-vanished countries, Chinese decals, indigo, colophony from Malabar, the eggs of exotic insects, parrots, toucans, live salamanders and basilisks, mandrake root, wind-up toys from Nuremberg, homunculi and flower pots, microscopes and telescopes, and above all, rare and unusual books, old folios full of the strangest etchings and stunning stories. Frankly, I doubt these folios could have been full of stories much stranger than Schultz's. What do these shops have to do with cinnamon? Josef calls them cinnamon shops because they have cinnamon color wainscoting. This reflection in particular, the arbitrary naming of something, suggests he is an adult looking back on his childhood. And I guess Cinnamon Shops does give him a kind of warmth. Warm like cinnamon. With a rare opportunity to be out at night alone, Yosef rushes to the Cinnamon Shops. But he actually doesn't get to them, instead wandering directly through a building, part of the gymnasium where he attends drawing classes. Here, Yosef indicates his teacher's name Professor Arendt. Would a little boy be taught by a professor, though? I don't know much about education in early 20th century Poland, so I'll hold my tongue. No further comment. Story mostly exists to wax poetic about the streets, Professor Arendt, and the snow glowing with moonlight. That's right, in cinnamon shops, we don't actually visit the cinnamon shops. The next chapter is The Street of Crocodiles. The real title story and the title story used for the first English publication are immediate neighbors. 
I understand now why the American publisher might choose this for the title story, even if the act's callously disrespectful. The Street of Crocodiles is, in my opinion, far superior to cinnamon shops. In 1986, the Quay Brothers released a stop-motion short film called The Street of Crocodiles. It is somehow vaguely inspired by this story or something, so I'll be using bits of it here, less because they correspond to Schultz and more for aesthetic interest. Which really means I need something to put on screen. Yusuf describes a map his father hides in his desk. A section of the city on this old map is not colored in and not filled out, as if incomplete. This blank area is the Street of Crocodiles, which most of the story is spent describing. The Street of Crocodiles was appended to Drahabich in imitation of contemporary Western capitalist trends, but it was only sort of half-heartedly tacked on. The Street of Crocodiles has an ambiguous and dubious character, so different from the fundamental tone of the city as a whole. We do not need to deny ourselves anything, the city's inhabitants think with pride. We can afford even true metropolitan debauchery. For the most part, despite its wonder, the city appears to be a stultifying influence on Yosef. And although Yosef is supposedly telling about the unsavory aspects of the Street of Crocodiles, on some level the story celebrates him. The native inhabitants of the city kept their distance from this quarter, inhabited as it was by scum, by rabble, by creatures without character, without solidity, by veritable moral garbage, the tawdry variant of man that emerges in such ephemeral environs. But on the days of their fall, in hours of low temptation, it would happen that one or another of the city's inhabitants would stray half-accidentally into that dubious quarter. The best people were not free at times from the temptation of voluntary degradation, of leveling borders and hierarchies, of wallowing in this shallow swamp of community, easy intimacy, filthy commingling. Yusuf gives an account of entering a tailor shop for a suit, only for the effeminate tailor to reveal a secret library of pornography. Cool! Note that Yosef doesn't describe himself doing this, but like a hypothetical person. My favorite detail here is about the droshkis on the street of crocodiles. If you never heard of them, a droshki is a type of horse-drawn carriage used in Slavic countries, especially Russia. My impression is they served a purpose similar to taxis. On the street of crocodiles, though, droshkis have neither horses nor drivers. Rather, the tight crowds just intentionally push them along by moving, and the passengers entrust themselves to these errant conveyances with the recklessness that characterizes everything here. That's marvelous! and extremely silly, almost sounds like a Monty Python sketch. Note that wax mannequins lurk in the shop windows of the Street of Crocodiles. Yakub warned us not to trifle with mannequins. In the ending, after describing a procession of sex workers, Yusuf becomes openly sorrowful about the Street of Crocodiles, because after leaving the tailor shop, one can never find it again. Its magic, perhaps the magic of a sexual awakening, is lost. Though, the street holds a great secret. This is that the depravity does not exist, because the tailor and the sales girls have no pornography, and the street of crocodiles is distinguished by an utterly mediocre depravity, stifled by thick layers of moral prejudices and banal vulgarity. In reality, the street may only exist on paper. That's a striking idea. The town wants a reckless, salacious street, but it's too boring to muster a genuine red light district. As usual, it isn't clear if the reader should take Yosef as literally existing in a dreamlike alternate universe, or if Yosef just looked at this weird spot on a map and let his imagination run wild with fantasies of what could be there. Fantasies too wild for Drahabich itself to ultimately give form. According to one website I found, some Michel's devotees believe the Street of Crocodiles is a real place. Um, Striska Street. Looks Pretty much like a normal street to me. The next chapter is Cockroaches. Here we leave the streets, returning to the apartment building. Adela has completely cleaned the rotting bird excrement and feathers from Yakub's avian kingdom, which is now rented out to a telephone operator. The only remnant? That condor with whom Yakub shared a chamber pot, a condor now stuffed by a taxidermist's diligent hands. Even the stuffed condor is falling apart, though. Yusuf calls the mannequin saga the splendid colorfulness of my father's age of genius. Interestingly, a while later, he endures his own age of genius in the aptly titled 
the Age of Genius, hallucinating or imagining bizarre animals that use his body as a medium for their images to be drawn on paper, like father, like son. It also suggests that Jakub's madness didn't last that long. This Age of Genius has been, what, a few weeks? Some age. In his latest obsession, Jakub becomes terrified of cockroaches. Unfortunately, cockroaches multiply and explode from all over the building. Father's behavior changed. His frenzy, the euphoria of his excitement, abated. In his movements and mimicry, signs of a guilty conscience began betraying themselves. He started avoiding us. He hid in corners all day long, in wardrobes, under the quilt. I often saw him observing his own hands as if in contemplation, studying the consistency of the skin, the nails, on which black spots were beginning to appear, glittering black spots, like the scales of a cockroach. After Jakub disappears completely, Yusuf assumes he finally became totally indistinguishable from the rest of that invasion of cockroaches. How Kafkaesque. Although, despite common misconceptions, in The Metamorphosis, Gregor Samsa doesn't turn into a cockroach or any real-life animal. Maybe a millipede. Someone calls poor Gregor a dung beetle, which is so far removed from a millipede that, obviously, no qualified entomologist must have lived or visited the Samsa household. Schulz's Cockroaches is a non-chronological narrative. This is the first time Schulz gives the mother dialogue. While she suffers from a migraine, Yusuf confronts her, subtly, craftily. What sense is there in all these rumors and lies that you're spreading about father, he says. This might be a good time to mention a shortcoming of the novel. Schulz definitely stays focused on a masculine perspective to the exclusion of girls and women as anything other than maternal figures or objects of desire. And fickle, deceitful ones at that. Consider Paulina and Polda, emphasized for their bodies, who then betray the masculine Jakub to Adela. Adela, for that matter, defined by laziness and supernatural feminine allure. It's like they're all different sexist tropes. Ugh. Though, I guess the men are absurd, too. And like the street of crocodiles or the swarms of cockroaches, Schulz seems to revel in what's normally considered gross or immoral. But the treatment of women, I don't know. It leaves a bad taste in my brain. So what lies has the mother been spreading? Yusuf believes his father turned into a cockroach and then turned into the stuffed condor in the telephone operator's room. The mother answers, Don't torment me, my dear. I already told you that father is traveling about the country as a traveling salesman. After all, you know that sometimes he arrives home at night only to drive on before dawn. Here it feels like the mask is slipping a bit. Is Yusuf simply an imaginative boy who, to cope with the trauma of his absent father, projects his desires for a present father onto the stuffed condor? The penultimate chapter, The Windstorm. Whoa, what's this thing? Is this some kind of demon conjuring seal? During that long empty winter, the darkness produced an immense hundredfold harvest in our city. In this case, it would seem that that harvest is a harvest of wind. As the title would suggest, this chapter concerns an intense windstorm that passed over the city that winter. There are some memorable images here. Because no one cleaned their attics of pots and bottles, the windstorm gathers them and sends them rampaging through the streets. We can interpret this as Yusuf hearing things being rattled around in the wind, but I prefer to imagine pots and pans literally storming around the city. My favorite bit of this story is this line. Here and there, a long person was bent low beneath it, flapping as he clung to a corner of a building. It's like something out of an old cartoon. Like a flag. That night, the family realizes nobody's seen Jakub since morning. They tend not to think about him, after all, what with him shrinking away into nothingness. Presumably, the wind, which even blows away the streets themselves, has stranded him in his shop. Theodore, the senior sales clerk, sets out into the night with Yusuf's brother to travel to the father's shop to bring him food. For once, we have a situation with traditional narrative suspense instead of pure, dreamy weirdness. How is Jakub holding up? How can Theodore navigate the windstorm? The answer comes almost immediately when they stagger back inside. Adela opens the door, finding them struggling to emerge from the windstorm in which they were trapped up to their armpits. First, this is at least the second time someone's been in something up to their armpits. Remember Pan? Second, 
I adore the way the windstorms turn into a physical substance, one in which someone could be stuck as in a swamp, struggling to start a fire and then quarreling with a woman identified as Aunt Paregia, Adela becomes so crazed with rage she rampages around the kitchen on makeshift stilts until finally somewhere in a corner, growing smaller and smaller, turning black, curled up like a limp piece of smoldering paper, she burned up completely into a flake of ash and crumbled into dust and nothingness. Another metamorphosis. Like Jakub, who seems to keep dying only to return, Adela appears in the final paragraph, alive and well again. You might also notice that Adela burning to ash seemingly has no connection to the initial conflict, the windstorm? Traditional narrative structure has little hold in Schultz's universe. The final chapter is entitled The Night of the Great Season. The Great Season, note that this is a proper noun, is spring. Josef harbors profound love for spring, probably because that's when things begin blooming, and of course can wax poetic about it for what feels like hours. But this story isn't about spring. Rather, it's about the end of the year. The Jewish year, that is, whose concluding month, Adar, is roughly analogous with the Gregorian calendar's March. That's why the end of the year and the thaw of spring can correspond. Everyone knows that in the course of ordinary normal years, every once in a while, eccentric time brings forth from its womb different years, peculiar years, degenerate years, onto which, like a sixth little finger on a hand, grows a thirteenth false month. I had no idea what that literally meant, and would have assumed the swollen year another of Schultz's wild, fleshy inventions. But Galchen explains in her introduction that this is Adar Bet, a month routinely appended to the Hebrew calendar. But she acknowledges we can see it as a bizarre year baby instead, taking the narration literally. The previous chapter's windstorm over, Yusuf visits his father in the shop. Yakub struggles to keep the sales clerks under control. They run amok, pursuing Adela, climbing up a building to get to her. Uh, for some reason, the narration calls the sales clerks dark, red-headed angels and handsome cherubs. This is the finale, too. Was something biblical happening this whole time? The house opened before him, room by room, chamber by chamber, like a house of cards, and he saw the sales clerk's pursuit of Adela through all the empty, brightly illuminated rooms, down the stairs and up the stairs, until she eluded them and fled into the bright kitchen, where she barricaded behind the kitchen cupboard. As weird as this is, Adela enjoys it. She has a good time. The sales clerks are also referred to as idolaters, and Jakub is likened to Moses. Yeah, look at some of these phrases. Something biblical is happening. Perhaps through all of Cinnamon Shops, Jakub, this sort of old patriarchal authority that is in decline, has been in a struggle for worship against the feminine authority of Adela. His name is Jakub, as in Jacob, Israel, the founder of the Jewish nation. Also, one of Jakub's sons is Yosef, as in Joseph, like one of Israel's sons was Joseph. In the sermons to the seamstresses, Jakub states that he's a demiurge, and that the old demiurge, that is, the god of the Hebrew Bible, doesn't hold exclusive sway over creation. So he is, in a way, identifying himself with this old god. But it's starting to sound like some mutation of Gnosticism. Adela has been battling Jakub since the beginning, wielding the power of her broom and tickling fingers, until the sales clerks who live downstairs, formerly angels serving this new demiurge, Jakub the god and prophet in one, have been lured to Adela, the idol. And, um, uh, where was I going with this? None of the idea tendrils seem to be growing to a more satisfactory explanation, but that's the nature of real stories like this one. Soon, however, Jakub calms, he accepts the loss of his angelic host to the sensual pleasures embodied in Adela. Then, the finale. Over the city gathers a kind of colorful rash, scattering rippling patches that grew, matured, and presently filled the vast expanse with a strange mob of birds, circling and wheeling in great intersecting spirals. This isn't a random host of birds. These are the descendants of those birds Adela exiled from Jakub's kingdom, returning to their homeland. However, they're weak, deformed, mutated, blind, many of them not flesh and blood, but mere imitation birds fashioned from paper. As I keep saying, metamorphoses. 
how moved father was by this attachment to the master that that exiled tribe had nursed like a legend in their soul, so that at long last, after many generations on the final day before the tribe's extinction, it would be lured back to its primeval fatherland. But people the narration just calls a stupid, witless tribe of jokesters hurl stones at the birds, and before Yakub can stop them, the birds are all dead. Wandering among the dead, presumably with Yosef, Yakub beholds firsthand the entire trashiness and total absurdity of that tawdry anatomy of the whole glorious avian tribe. Cinnamon Shops and Other Stories ends as the fake day begins to resemble a real one. Adela grinds some coffee beans. By this point, I'd answered one question. From what perspective does Yusuf tell these stories? He's reflecting as an adult on his early childhood when his father fell ill. The magical events are a mythologizing of a child's skewed perceptions of the world of adults. One of my problems with Cinnamon Shops is that Yusuf, for the most part, isn't really a character. He only rarely interacts with situations and often seems to know much more than it seems he could. Like, how could he know Uncle Carol's morning routine so well? Did he stand around watching Carol toss and turn in his bed and then wake up? Frequently, Yusuf seems less like a character present in the action, and more like a specter watching events unfold. There's an authority to the narration that makes you assume these stories are largely autobiographical. Supernatural scenes like saline solutions coming to life somehow metaphors for incidents in Schultz's own youth. Cinnamon shops might well be autobiographical. Like Yusuf, Bruno Schultz studied art, and his father was named Jakub and worked as a cloth merchant. These stories aren't only the fictional Yusuf's interpretations of his fictional boyhood. Perhaps they're interpretations of Schultz's own childhood memories. But you shouldn't assume such things about an author. Convincing fiction may well seem too convincing to be fictional. I'll state this more confidently, though. Yusuf tells us stories that transform his childhood memories and emotions into mythology. Myths tend to be dreamy and make only the vaguest rational sense, right? Why does Zeus turn into a goose to have sex with a human woman? What exactly is Grendel? Why does Izanagi washing his body transform the water into new deities? What exactly is that mark God put on Cain? Myth may be a useful lens for understanding cinnamon shops. Except Schultz's stories also include banal daily details like going to work and grinding coffee. Hmm. Well, this confusion of myth, reality, and dream is par for the course for irreal literature. Schultz's method of densely mortared metaphor is unique, clearly. But besides metamorphoses, there are tons of recurring elements. Fluttering eyelids, one arabesque after another, and there's a lesser focus on people being up to their armpits and things. I suppose these are the linguistic tics and mannerisms of Schultz's style Levine's introduction refers to. This brings us to The Senatorium Under the Hourglass, dedicated to... Uh, to Josefina Shilins Shilinska, Schultz's fiancée, with whom he apparently translated a Franz Kafka story. Their relationship didn't work out, however. Shilinska needed Schultz to move away from Drohobich, which would mean losing the literary magic he found there. In English, this book's normally called the Sanatorium Under the Sign of the Hourglass, which creates an even stranger mental image. Fittingly enough, the novel is much, much stranger than Cinnamon Shops. Additionally, it's a direct sequel to Cinnamon Shops, another childhood myth memoir. In this sequel, my largest criticisms of Cinnamon Shop's been answered. Yusuf is an active participant in the novel's events. Initially, I assumed this was more of the same year discussed in Cinnamon Shop's, but in the chapter Spring, Yusuf uses a gun. Of course, it could be some kind of toy or imaginary gun. Though in Schultz's world of transformations, Yusuf could probably pop from a child to an adult pretty quickly, just pop just like that. To be honest, I know I've been trying to sound positive, but I was a bit disappointed with Cinnamon Shop's wasn't half as weird as I hoped. But here? Here's the super weirdness I'm looking for. 
includes philosophical political criticism of Emperor Franz Joseph I, Jakub joining the fire department and walking around in a full suit of knightly armor, Josef seeking a girlfriend, and the eponymous Sanatorium Under the Hourglass, the first instance either book seems to remove us from Josef's hometown. This is very strange, very bizarre, very magical. I thought it was really fun. After dying, Jakub went to this sanatorium. The doctor there can set back time, creating a possibility, however unlikely, for recovery. Surrounding the sanatorium is a town overgrown with vegetal life so luxuriant that at almost all times of day it's pitch black. Day and night both are full of sleep and menace. The political activist and literary enthusiast Peter Zalmayev called Sanatorium Under the Hourglass, in my opinion correctly, quote, one of the most dreamlike, heart-rending, if also sinister, pieces of writing in the history of literature. Definitely the most disturbing story Schultz wrote for us. It's ghostly, not in the manner of a ghost story, but of a nightmare in which dread presses on you but you can't articulate why. A frightening rather than comical episode, although Schultz retains some humor. In the novel's final story, we learn of Jakub's final fate. We also see Nimrod the dog again. After his eponymous chapter in Cinnamon Shops, I don't think Yusuf mentions the dog again until now. Uncle Carol's there too. It's fitting to reconnect to the past stories here in the ending, whose tone is bleak after Adela has left for America and the business has begun to flounder, and Jakub, in his second death, has metamorphosed into a trilobite-like arthropod. The Sanatorium Under the Hourglass, the book, not the chapter, also reveals under what circumstances Yosef has been telling us these memories. I was right, he is an adult. And not just an adult, he's a pensioner shut-in reminiscing on his childhood. That is, until he embarks on an adventure that transforms him back into a child. This was my secret motive for summarizing Cinnamon Shops, so that you can skip it for the Sanatorium Under the Hourglass. You know, if you want to. Get a copy of this book and read the much more interesting second novel inside. You know, if you want. Though many people may find this prose too intricate to follow, Sanatorium Under the Hourglass is, if you can believe it, even more dense and abstract than Cinnamon Shops. It is slow reading. Scholes is definitely a writer who sacrifices accessibility for lyricism. Two dream prose poetry memoir novels not enough for you? Collected Stories also includes four other short stories. Still not satisfied? Uh, that's all Schultz wrote. But as an art teacher, he was also an illustrator. If I understand correctly, Schultz's original publications included his own unsettling drawings. One of them sampled for the cover of this edition. I really wish they'd included them throughout. But I thought it was really cool that there are actual pictures in this one. It just like brought a little sense of like almost, um, just like fun to it if anything. Uh, so there's that. That's the source of these weird pictures that have appeared and disappeared over the course of this video. Schultz himself. They're as eerie yet funny as his writing. And every story of Schultz is a protest, full of humor and irony, but protest against oblivion and boredom. Schultz's writing belongs to a unique genre, related to, yes, Kafka, but also Max Blecher, and even writers who aren't Eastern European Jewish men between the world wars. Some would identify this genre as irreal, including Max Blecher, evidently, who in his haunting novel on the subject describes hallucination-like states from his childhood as adventures in irreality. According to G.S. Evans of the literary magazine Café Ariel, the Ariel genre can be most easily identified in terms of how the laws of the fictional universe function. In realist fiction, these laws will be the physics of our own universe, or in fantasy, an internally consistent system of magic or something like that. But in Ariel fiction, not only is the physics underlying the story impossible, but it is also fundamentally and essentially unpredictable and unexplained. There is no reason, no motive for the strange events occurring in the story, nor is there any protagonist, such as a wizard, scientist, god, or practical joker, making it happen. To spread the strangeness on even more thickly, a typical Ariel story cannot be analyzed as a direct metaphor or allegory. The attempt to reduce it to such symbolic or satirical scheme must ultimately be frustrated. 
which is where some of the technical skill of writing a real fiction comes in. The events, characters, and physics of the story must be such that they cannot be satisfactorily reduced to one such interpretation. And true enough, I can't satisfactorily reduce Schultz's stories to one interpretation. I'll uh, link Evans's essay What is a Realism in the description, and some other things. We feel our life mostly when they drain out of our veins, when we are aging, when we are losing gradually our physical abilities, our bodily functions, our health. And when we read Bruno Schulz, in every page, suddenly things, all things, revert to the roots of their existence, to the most authentic pulse of life. Suddenly, we want more. Whatever happened to Bruno Schultz? Why did he only write these two novels and four short stories? He had purportedly been cultivating another novel, entitled Messiah, but recall that Schultz was a Jewish man in post-World War I Poland. The story of his death is almost as famous as his extraordinary imagination. If you thought to look at this video, you probably already know this, too. In 1942, an SS officer shot Schultz in the street. There seem to be some variations on the story. The monster who murdered Schultz may have done so in a quarrel with fellow Nazi Felix Landau, but it's very clear on that point. In 1942, an SS goon shot Bruno Schultz. We can grant Schultz some abstract victory. Oh, we're honoring the glorious artist Bruno Schultz today, but who knows that loathsome vermin who murdered him? You try telling that to Schultz? I wonder how many other geniuses and potential geniuses the Nazis killed, and how many more die unthanked and forgotten in every senseless bombing, shooting, and slaughter on behalf of every half-wit tyrant parading on the world stage today. In the decades since his murder, Schultz, the irreal mythologizer, has become himself a rather mythologized figure. Anecdotes about his death, life, and lost novel have sprouted like all the weird vegetal life in his stories. Apparently, that lost novel's manuscript remains one of those legendary artifacts some people quest after. Since 2004, Drahovich has honored him with the International Bruno Schultz Festival. There are also apparently some artistic disputes between Poland and Israel for who owns Schultz, who can claim his art for their tradition. That's a silly question if you ask me. He's Polish and Jewish. It's not an either-or. Plus, Schultz only wrote in Polish? But if scholars can put him in English, then they can put him into any language. That's the point of translation. Schultz, or his art anyway, belongs to everybody. Oh yeah, since I've been throwing around the word mythology, Schultz also wrote an essay entitled The Mythologization of Reality, in which he argued that our entire understanding of reality is itself a mythologization, because it's based not upon reality directly, but rather upon the words we use to describe reality. In his own words, as translated by John M. Bates, When we employ commonplace words, we forget that they are fragments of ancient and eternal stories, that, like barbarians, we are building our homes out of fragments of sculptures and the statues of the gods. There is not even one of our ideas that is not derived from mythology, a mythology that has been transformed, mutilated, remolded. Poetry arrives at the meaning of the word anticipando, deductively, on the basis of great and daring shortcuts and approximations. Knowledge tends to the same inductively, methodically, taking the entire material of experience into account. At bottom, both one and the other have the same aim. The human spirit is tireless in its glossing of life with the aid of myths, in its making sense of reality. At present, we consider the word to be merely a shadow of reality, its reflection, but the reverse would be more accurate. Reality is but a shadow of the word. Hold on. Collected stories looks familiar. In an earlier, even worse video, I talked about Tropic of Orange. Could it be? Widths, heights, lengths, indistinguishable. What is this? <laughs> <laughs>